You're listening to the Journey to Launch podcast. How Anita paid off $95,000 of debt in one year and retired early. T minus 10 seconds. Welcome to the Journey to Launch podcast with your host, Jamila Souffrant. As a money expert who walks her talk, she helps brave journeyers like you get out of debt, save, invest, and build real wealth. Join her on the journey to launch to financial freedom in, in five, four, three, two, one. Hey, 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 journeyers. Welcome to the Journey to Launch podcast. If you are a returning listener, that means journeyer, welcome back. If you are brand new, welcome. So excited to have you in this rocket with us. We are legit taking off. Now, the premise of Journey to Launch and my platform and what I do is I want to show you what's possible through what I do and then obviously bringing on stories and information and motivation from other people. And so while I talk about reaching financial independence and retiring early, which is essentially having enough money where you can choose what you really want to do. And for me, like I always envision that even if I had all the money in the world, I would still want to work in some capacity. But the dream for a lot of you is, okay, I'm working, I'm trying to pay off debt. I'm also going to eventually save and invest and have enough money, right? The dream is to have enough money to retire or reach financial independence. And then what what does that look like, right? Like, what will it be like for you on the other side? And so I love talking to people who have actually achieved financial independence, and especially those who have chosen to retire early, meaning like they're not actively working. So I have a wonderful, wonderful conversation to bring you. I'm talking to Anita from The Power of Thrift. Anita has been in in the blogging game for a minute, meaning she's had her blog for a long time now. And she's someone who's actually retired early. And she just has, I think, just great, like realistic perspective because she's done it, right? And now she's living that life and she shares what it's like on the other side. So I really think that you are going to enjoy this episode And it's going to just kind of peel back the layers of what you're striving for. And once you get there, and my hope is that as you strive to pay off debt, save and invest, that you're you're actually building a life you love along the way. And you shouldn't be waiting just until you get to your goal, you know, the end point to enjoy it. Right. And so I hope that this interview and just in general, my content inspires you to live a really thoughtful and wonderful life now and not just wait for the end goal. Okay, journeyers, real quick, I have an exciting announcement. I will be speaking at the Financial Freedom Summit from May 1st to May 3rd. It's going to be in St. Louis. What is the Financial Freedom Summit? Well, it's being put together by my buddy Grant Sabatier, who you may know because he's been on the podcast twice. So long time journeyers who listen to the podcast. You may have heard him a couple times on the podcast. He has a brand and book called Financial Freedom, which is amazing. He's been on episode 48 of the podcast and episode 82 of the podcast talking about how he went from broke to being financially independent and talking about his book, Financial Freedom. And now he is putting together an event where you can come and network and learn from other people who are just like you who want to achieve financial freedom. So you know how I'm always talking about FinCon, which is like the personal finance conference for creators like myself, podcasters and bloggers. Well, this conference is more for people like you, listeners, journeyers, who just want to really deepen their knowledge, get that support and learn and network with other attendees and experts on how they can reach financial freedom. So this is for you and I'd love to see you there. The conference is going to be in St. Louis from May 1st to May 3rd, 2020. You can grab your ticket by going to journeytolaunch.com slash Freedom Summit. That's again, journeytolaunch.com slash Freedom Summit. I'd love to be there with you, meet you. Also, another super cool announcement. Last year, Grant and I shot some pretty cool videos together. We kind of created this this conglomerate called the Money Collective where we came together and we shot some videos on different topics. And I'd love for you to check it out. It's our YouTube channel called the Money Collective. And I'm going to link that in the show notes. But if you just want to go directly check it out, go to journeytolaunch.com slash money collective. There we basically talked about so many um, interesting topics on camera. We talked about what money is, the fire movement, basically white male privilege. Like we went there with it. 
uh, all the things. So you should check out the channel and then let me know what you think. I'll also be sharing it all over social media this week. So you'll see it if you follow me on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook, or if you are on my weekly newsletter list. Now, once again, I'd love to see you at the Financial Freedom Summit from May 1st to May 3rd. If you want to grab your ticket, make sure you do at journeytolaunch.com slash freedom summit. Anyway, I'm excited for you to hear this episode. This is episode 136. So if you want the episode show notes, want to find more about Anita, she's going to mention where you can find her in the episode, but you can go to journeytolaunch.com slash episode 136. And as always, share this with your family and friends or anyone that you know or think should hear this information. All right, without further ado, let's hop into this conversation with Anita. Hey, journeyers, I'm excited to bring you this conversation or to have this conversation and have you listen in because I hope it will be beneficial for your journey to financial independence and freedom. Today, I have Anita who is from the Power of Thrift, a.k.a. Thrifty Gal, on the podcast. Hi, Anita. Hi, guys. <laughs> so a previous guest who is a journeyer. So by the way, if people listen to this and are on the journey with me to financial freedom and independence, they're called journeyers. Okay, I love it. <laughs> a previous journeyer, actually Charlie, he's actually a dumpster diver living in Florida. And yeah, he actually had a really cool story. And he talked to just about sustainable living and how house hacking and he talked about, I remember he came across your blog and inspired him. That's awesome. And so I think I looked you up that way. And that's how I found out about you. And then I started reading some of your stuff and I was like, holy crap. Like, <laughs> I think Anita would be great for the show because one, you've reached financial independence. Right. It's been about four years now. So you know what it's like on the other side. And so there's everyone listening to this, there are different levels of where they're starting, just starting out a little more advanced, maybe even have already accomplished what you have done. But I think so many people want to know what it's like on the other side. And so I do want to talk about that. But first, get into how you accomplished such an amazing feat at how old? I was 33 when I officially retired. Okay. So let's take it back a little bit about how you did it, right? So I know you were a lawyer. Yep. So I was very lucky. And then I was a corporate lawyer and I made a ton of money and I lived super simply. I saved 85 to 95% of my income. And, you know, within five years, I had paid off $100,000 in student loans, and I saved about $700,000. So I was very lucky that my income was very high, and I was very frugal. Um, But it's certainly possible if you make less money, I think it'll just take a little bit longer. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that you just started out like boldly, like I made a lot of money, and I was just very conscious about what I spent because you know, the whole fire movement now, like it's a big thing. And I think for a lot of people, and I try to do my best job as I can to always mention that a lot of people that are reaching financial independence, especially in a short time frame, like you said, like you could do it, but it might just take longer if you don't earn as much. They're doing it based on like income, even if they're choosing to spend less. So while frugality and being thrifty is one of the things that is going to be helpful, really the how fast you can go is based on how much you make. Absolutely. It's just what percentage of your income you can save. And that's the main factor. So I actually have a lot of lawyers who listen because I'm assuming just what you're like, I know you had a lot of college debt or you had a debt you paid off. Yeah, I had about $100,000 in student loans that I paid off in a year. Let's talk about that. So when you graduated, how much did you start making? My salary when I was out of law school was 160 grand plus whatever bonuses at the end of the year. I don't remember the exact number, but it was, uh, I was thinking it was 10 grand bonus the first year, maybe, maybe higher. I don't remember the exact number. I could look it up, but I have it off the top of my head. <laughs> so if there's like two types of people listening to this, one, or there's a lot of types of people, but like, if I'm just going to like <laughs> think about just like main, like thinking of someone who took on law school debt, but did not graduate making that much money and has more responsibility, like maybe they already had children or whatever, they have a already kind of locked in lifestyle that they can't, or they don't feel like they can change. And then there are people who actually end up making as much money as you do, but are still not making this kind of progress or intensity. Right. It's the golden handcuffs. What made you want to even save that much? Like when you graduated, how did you know to do this? Well, when I was 17, I read the book, Your Mind, Your Life by Vicki Robbins. And I don't know if you have heard of that one, but it's a pretty... Oh yeah. She's on the podcast. Of course. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. So I read it when I was 17 and I had a life bucket list that I had made when I was like nine. 
And so Retire Early went on my left bucket list at 17 after reading that book. And then I kind of went to college and like I lived life and I didn't really think about it for a while. And then I went to law school and I learned how much I was making as a first year associate it would be $160,000. So before I started officially working, I reread Your Money or Your Life. And I was like, well, if I'm making four times what the average person is making, I could probably retire about four times earlier. So I started my retirement chart and I like listed all my expenses. I tried to minimize everything and I just went from there. Yeah. And good for you for reading it that young and saying, hey, I could do this. Yeah. I was a voracious reader as a kid. I think that's my number one ability to to do something like that. Just have have the idea in your head. Yeah, it's huge. It's huge. And that's why it's important for people to hear stories like yours, because while you had the income as a definite help, it's like you had to first believe that you could, because before you had the income, you had the idea. Right. Absolutely. So did you know that you wanted to be a lawyer because you'd make more? Or was there something driving you to become a lawyer? I had to get an advanced degree on my life bucket list. So when I was 20, I was working in insurance and I had graduated and I hated it. I was miserable. So I, I was also pre-med in, law, in, in college. So you no know, thing about taking either the pharmacy test or the law school test and the law school test was just easier. So I took that and then I got into a pretty good school and then, you know, it all kind of went from there. Mm-hmm. And so how much debt did you graduate with again? From law school, it was a hundred thousand. From undergrad, it was like maybe 20,000. Right. And so w- you then graduated now and you're like, well, I'm going to pay off this debt as fast as possible. Yes, absolutely. Like that was just a huge anchor around my neck. I was so terrified that people would find out that I was an imposter and that I was not a good lawyer. They'd fire me and I'd have this huge debt payment over my head. So my number one priority was to get rid of that debt as soon as possible. And every extra cent went towards it. I mean, I was obsessed that first year. I looked at my these spreadsheets that I made and how much interest I would pay the bank. I looked at it like every hour that I was at work. I'd like tab over to it while I was doing something else just to kind of motivate myself. Like, this is what I'm working towards. This is what I'm doing. And I can imagine though, you also graduated with other lawyers. How was that like? Because there are a lot of lawyers who were making probably as much as you were, who were not focused on that. Oh, no. I mean, I think I knew I didn't want to be a corporate lawyer forever. So if you want to be a corporate lawyer and like you want to have that lifestyle for the rest of your life, you're going to be making a ton of money for the rest of your life. So I think people don't really care in the beginning that they have like student loan debts. They think, oh, I'll pay it off. because like they think that they're going to do it forever and it's not a big deal. But I knew that I wanted more from my life than just working 70 hours a week and sitting behind a desk in an office. So that was my main priority. And I don't begrudge anybody for doing choosing another another path. It's just, I knew it was kind of foreign to everybody else who I talked to about it, but I talked about it constantly to everybody because I was obsessed and that was always on my mind. Yeah. Yeah. So how long ago did you graduate? Um, I graduated law school in 2009. So it's been 10 years now. Wow. And where did you start working? So I know part of that was you kept your expenses low. So can you talk a little bit what you did to do that? Well, I was a very lucky person. In 2009, it was a recession. And my law firm was like, well, we don't have a lot of work because it's a recession. So if you want to take a year off, we'll pay you a third of your salary and you can go do whatever you want for a year. So they paid me $77,000 to basically travel for a year. And I didn't pay attention to my loans during that year at all. I just kind of enjoyed it. I paid the minimums and I you know, I paid my sister back some of the money that I had borrowed from her. But when I started working, that was when I was like a little bit, that's when I started becoming obsessed. You know, I, I picked a very uh, reasonable cost of living city, Chicago, instead of New York or California, where all my friends were going. I got a roommate. So my expenses were super low. I brought my breakfast to work every day. I brought my lunch to work every day. And I worked a lot. So they paid for my dinner. They paid for my cab home. So my expenses were so minimal. I think I paid like some months I was like, a credit card bill would be like $63 or something crazy like that. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So every cent went to it. And I'm just amazed when you said that they paid you one third of your salary to travel. I'm just like, oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I tell people that and it's like, nobody believes me because it's such a crazy, crazy thing, but they wanted to keep their reputation up as one of the top firms. I worked for Scatter Arts, which is one of the top like global law firms in the world. And I just got really lucky, just time and place. Mm-hmm. And did that year off of traveling, I know you already had this like mindset that you want to retire early, but did that yeah. further solidify it for you? <laughs> yes, a hundred percent. I mean, it was amazing. I did not want to go back to work after I, after that year was up because 
life was just so wonderful. And I was like, I could have this life all the time if I wanted it. So it was a pretty, pretty motivating thing. Yeah. So, okay. You paid off your debt in one year, you said? Yeah. So one year of working. So from 2009 to 2010, I traveled and I paid, you know, minimum amounts. But then 2010 to 2011, I had like $95,000 left at that point, And I paid all that off in a year. Mm-hmm. But with that, you're being very conscious, very dedicated to not spending a lot of money. So you sacrificed that year to do that. So did you have any investments at that point? I had my, my 401k from when I was working as an insurance from the ages of 20 to 23. But other than that, I didn't think about investments at all. I was just focused on getting the debt down to zero. And I'm not sure that that would be great advice to someone now, just because like, some of my student loans are like 3%. So math wise, I could see the argument for not doing it. But just for my sanity, I wanted to be able to say that I was debt free. And that, yeah. that to me was worth the, you know, the added, the, the, the money I might have lost from investing earlier. And that's the thing, like the emotional part of it is huge, right? Like that, you know, some people are like, oh, don't pay off your mortgage early because you can make more in the market, which, yeah, like mathematically wise, that makes sense. But a lot of that is emotional, where it's like, I just don't want that looming over my head. Like I want to be able to decrease my fixed expenses, right? And that that's worth more than the market return of X for some people. Exactly. Not having to have any student loan payments and not having to worry about like, oh, I need to have some sort of income to pay this off was worth was priceless to me. Yeah. And then you were able to do it in a year, right? Like if this was going to take you like 10 years, even because there's some people, right, who don't earn the income you have. And so even if they right. wanted to be really serious about it, like it would still take them a really long time. And so therefore, yeah, of course you shouldn't wait to start investing in, on the other side for compounding. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Because you're going to burn out if you you know, go into the intensity that I did for 10 years. That's just, I don't think it's possible. I don't think the, you know, I don't think that's healthy either. For a year, I could, you know, anyone can sacrifice anything, but anything longer than that, I think I would have lost my mind a little bit. <laughs> mm-hmm. Now in your real life. So like while you were doing this, um, were like, what kept you motivated? So like nowadays, right, there are tons of podcasts and blogs. So you're traveling along this. Did you have friends like who were motivating you? Like, what was that like in the I had a couple of friends that were very early in the days, you know, they didn't have any podcasts or blogs or anything. We just kind of talked about it through G-chat from back in the day. And that was super helpful. And I know that they're all like one retired at 29 and one retired at 32. And, you know, they're all, they're not famous people. You wouldn't recognize their names or anything. They were just super motivated and people, we just stumbled across each other in real life. And it was like, we talked about this. And when we realized that we were both doing it, it was kind of, it was kind of a great motivation. So I'm so glad this is a big community now and people realize it's a normal, attainable thing. Because when I started and I, I talked about it to my, my Malaria friends, kind of people thought I was crazy. And Yeah. You know. <laughs> I have to ask those friends that you said retired at 29, 31, what did they do? They were all engineers. So they didn't make quite as much money as me, but, you know, they were very focused and they had their masters at getting their expenses low. Yeah. Just help me with the timeline here because you just said that you um, paid off debt from 2010 to 2011. So how old were you at that point after like a debt payoff? I was 27. 27. And then you said, how old were you when you reached financial independence or your number? Um, So I was 32 when I, my last day at the office. And then I took six weeks off and I took all my paid vacation. And in that time I turned 33. So I was just turning 33 and that was 2015. Right. So like five, six years from like almost not much, probably in your 401k because you weren't focusing on it. Right. Then in 2015, I had $690,000 when I quit my job. Right. So let's talk a little bit about what that was like. So I know now that when you pay off all that debt, you can now push all that money into investing. So what were your investing vehicles? I am a big fan of BTSAX. That's my major investments thing. I think that's pretty much the only thing I have. I, think I have a little bit of, you know, in um, a money market account and I have a little bit in like a bond thing, but it's a negligible amount um, in the REIT. But VTSAX is just the total stock market index fund. I'm sure you are very familiar with it. Yeah. So I talk about that, but I always like to go back just in case it's like the first time someone's heard about it or listening to the podcast, right? So it's um, an index fund. Uh, do you want to just like talk about it a little bit more? It just, it's the total stock market in total stock market index from, from Vanguard. And it has the lowest expense ratio of pretty much any investment out there. So I like to say that I'm betting on civilization. It's every single company you can buy. And as long as civilization continues, you know, my investments will continue to do well. 
So it's been four years since I retired and I've spent, you know, however much money I've spent on my expenses and my income has increased to 925. What do you say? 925, 925 a month? 925,000. So I had 700,000 when I retired. And now four years later, I have 925,000 when I spend probably 24,000 a year to live. Okay. So let's go back a little bit. So when you were in this investing mode, reaching financial independence, you are, I'm assuming maxing out every available tax advantage account. Like what was that like? If you could break that down. So I'm terrible at the tax stuff. I should listen to your podcast because I don't know anything about that. Honestly, I maxed out my 401k because that was an easy one to do. And then everything else I just threw into Vanguard and I don't, I don't really pay attention to anything after that. So far it's worked out well, but I know for sure that there are things that I could do tax wise. Like, like there's the, you know, the Roth ladder or whatever you call it. Yeah. I don't do it all. And I mean, I know you can do like FHAs or something. I don't do any of that stuff. I'm just, I'm very lazy when it comes to taxes. Yeah, no. And that's fine. So that's also the show. Like some people like find joy in like, optimizing every single thing. I think I'm more like you where I'm like, just put it in Vanguard and like, I don't really think about it again. And then exactly, I'm sure there's more things I can be doing, but like, I'd rather be optimizing for my business and making more money versus kind of like saving here. Or I mean, it's all relative, I think, to like what kind of tolerance or the kind of level of how you want to get into things like that. Agreed a hundred percent. Yeah, there's so many things that you can do. So you just have to find things that you enjoy doing and do it, go from there. Like I really enjoyed minimizing my expenses and kind of playing games with myself and like how I can do that as opposed to like playing the system and figuring out that. Mm -hmm. And some people listening was like, well, you know, I'm definitely, I'd rather create more income or find a way to like do something else. Right. Right. High side hustles and stuff. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you were able to accumulate $700,000. So most of that outside of your 401k was then in taxable accounts. Right. Yeah. So it's been four years, you said, since you stopped working? Mm-hmm. Four years. So how did you know that was time, right? Because some people will say, oh, just work another year. You get on that kind of treadmill. Right. Well, my initial goal was $450,000, which would give me $1,500 a month. And I knew I could live on that. But then I, my law firm offered me a secondment to live in Sydney, Australia for a while. So I moved to Sydney for two years and then at the end of the secondment when I was like, all right, it's time to go back to Chicago if you want. I was like, no, I I think I'm done. I think this is a good natural stopping point for me. So I think if I hadn't done that, it would have been a lot harder to have picked a stopping point. So I'm really glad that that happened to me Mm. because it it really is easy to get into the mindset like, oh, it's one more year. Like every month I make 13 grand a month. So it's like, why not do one more month and one more month? And I could see getting to the mentality and not knowing when to stop. Yeah. Even just taking like, like, so for me, like the risk, I left my well-paying job to like venture into this world of entrepreneurship and more freedom and time. That's awesome. So brave. Yeah. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) To reach my financial independence number. And so part of me was like, well, you know, I can like continue working for the next four years and reach it for sure, or take this risk. And Luckily, I had like my baby. So I have three kids. So my third child. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> my my third child, actually, like I, if it wasn't for her, I don't know that I would have made the leap as I did. But like I said, like, I'm not going back to work after I have her. So like that was my deadline versus like if I didn't have like a deadline I'm, and that was going to happen, like God willing, and it did. That was what made me kind of be like, this is where I'm going to stop because I could have been like one more year, one more year, then you do it. That is so valuable that you have three kids and you're talking, doing this podcast. I'm like, that's amazing. I really think that most of the space for FI is like engineers, male engineers who are single or who have like, or married and they don't like, they don't have kids until after they're done the FI. So the fact that you're doing this is huge. Yeah. Thank you. And I think too, that's what's also show, which is why I like bringing on different perspectives. Like, so right now, right, you're coming from a perspective of earning a lot of money, but you didn't spend a lot of money. Right. And you made a lot of sacrifices to do that. And so some people are not in that position yet that they are earning a lot. Some of them are still battling debt. Some of them already have kids. So there's a lot of just like ingrained expenses that they're working through in debt, right? But there are different ways and maybe it won't take them like four or five years. It might take them 15. But I think the important thing here is you can optimize depending on what you want, whether that's your income or your expenses and reach something, something, some level of happiness and freedom. You don't have to wait to this far out date. You can start making changes today. Absolutely. And 20 years is still better than 45. Anything that can show you that you can do it earlier, that you can live the life that you want to live at some point is huge. Yeah. So you now 
are living off of how much you said a year? I'd say about $24,000 a year, maybe a little bit less. And how are you getting that income to live? So I just take it out of my, my VTSAX. So the first couple of years I had very healthy tech returns. So I had the first year I had it from the United States and then the second year I had it from Australia because their, their fiscal years are different. So the first couple of years I got it from there and then I had cash savings. So this past year was the first year that I took it out of my Vanguard total stock market index. Yeah. And when it comes to that, right? So now you're draw- kind of drawing down on your portfolio. And I saw on your blog that you started working. So I, I, I do want to talk about, and not like full time, but you had to like create, you said like systems and like something to do. And yeah. <laughs> this is the other side, right? So everyone's like dreaming of the day that I cannot have to go into work for anyone else. And I can literally choose what I do, right? You're living that life. You've been living this life for now for four years. What is it really like? No, I'm really glad you talked about that because... It can get really lonely. It can get really lost. You have a place in the system when you're working and when you're not working. I mean, sometimes I think if I died, no <laughs> one would know for a few days because I don't have a job. So I don't have a job to go into. And like, I, I know I don't see everybody every day. It gets a little bit lonely. So you kind of have to make your own system and you have to make your own schedule. Like for me, it took me a while to realize that I really need routine and without it, I'm a little bit lost. So I have all these systems that I do. Like I have these, this thing called a resolutions chart where I fill in every single day that I have to work out. I have to meditate. I have to write four hours. I have to read 50 pages. I have to socialize with somebody. And that's really what drives my life. And I think if I didn't have it, I, I would fall into a pit of depression because it can get really easy to just, well, there's no one's expecting you to do anything. So it's easy to not do anything. So you have to get that expectation from yourself. Yeah, I think that's hard, right? Like everyone thinks that they want this freedom from like working in general, where it's just like, I think actually work, like meaningful work that you want to do. So whatever that looks like is important. Like you have to have a reason. Like I think there's some statistics, I don't know the exact one, but like people who retired or don't have anything to do, like they die faster or something. Because Oh, yeah. Yeah. I just read a book called um, How Not to Die by a pathologist or a coroner. And she says that like, purpose in life is the one reason, way, one way you can like live a long time. P- purpose and having a social social support network. Human beings aren't meant to do nothing and sit around all day. Like sitting around kills your body. Yeah, I did want to talk about the resolutions chart because it's something you invite your readers to kind of come along with you and do because yeah, I'm still working. So here's the cool thing, right? Like, and what I try to tell people is that even if you're on the journey. And there's some years to come that you're going to reach this one-off goal or, you know, this final number, the longest part, you should make it worthwhile and enjoyable and like find freedom from where you are. So I think like this resolution chart helps people do that because you don't have to wait until like this date to do that. You can start doing some of the things you want right now. So can you talk a little bit about like how, even if you have a job, like you can start implementing these things in your life Yeah, I love that you say that too, because I hate that people think that, oh, my life is going to start as soon as I'm retired. It's like, it's a journey that matters and it's not the end result because there really is never going to be an end result. Like if you want to start living your life now, live the life you want to live. Just, you have to take a while and think about what that is. And I think that's the hardest part because it's so easy to just, you know, become a drone and like do what everyone thinks you're supposed to do. Whereas when you're retired, it's like, well, now I have to figure out what I want to do with my life. And so if you can do that while you're working and you kind of ease into it, like you're doing, you started that podcast a lot earlier. So you like, you know that this is what you like doing. This is how you want to fill your time. So the resolution chart for me is kind of like how I grade myself at life. Like I was always pretty good student in school and I really like getting those A's. And now that I don't have a teacher or a boss telling me that I'm doing a good job, I need to be telling myself that I'm doing a good job. So having that chart and saying, okay, like I wrote, you know, 31 days this month, I worked out 31 days this month for 600 minutes, I read 4000 pages or whatever, just having that accomplishment at the end of the month, so I can see it and tell myself that I'm living the life I want to live. And this is the proof is huge. Mm -hmm. It's interesting with the whole like structure right too. So not only purpose, but structure, because even as being like, so everyone's like, Oh, I want to be my own boss. I want to be an entrepreneur, but even that, right? When you wake up, you realize, wait, like I give myself my schedule. You realize that it's all on you. Like there's no one telling you what to do, but yourself. And so you have to create and stick to deadlines. And that's hard for people. Absolutely. If you're not that type of person who is able to do that for yourself, then it's going to be a very hard, hard thing to do. Like if you need, I'm, I, I need external motivation. I need other people's approval. 
And it's been a really, like the resolution chart has been the one thing that has kept me. Cause like, I feel like that's somebody else looking at my chart. It's future me being like, how have you lived your days? You know, so it's like external motivation from my future self. I love that you're honest about your, like who you are, right? Cause there's some people who need external validation. Like that's just like naturally part of it. And of course we'd all want to walk around like, Oh, I don't, you know, care about what people think. And I'm this, <laughs> but I feel like we all kind of sometimes have a natural disposition to care more about certain things or not. Right. And I think sometimes when you like try to deny that part of yourself and pretend it's not you instead of like working through like how to help, that's when things like you mess things up because you're not being truthful with who you are. Absolutely. There's a book called uh, The Four Tendencies by Gretchen Rubin that talks about that. I don't know if you've, you sound like you've heard of it, but I'm definitely an obliger. Like I, I thrive on external motivation, but if you're an upholder and you thrive on internal motivation, I feel like that's a natural entrepreneur. It's all about going down to knowing yourself and knowing how to motivate yourself, how to pass the time to make yourself happy. Yeah. And you wrote this letter. So correct me if I'm wrong. Did you get like a part-time job? I feel like I read that. Was that... <laughs> It's like a part-time job in my head. So I have to write for four hours a day, just kind of for myself. I'm my own boss, you know what I mean? And like, I, I have an LLC, so I like make board meetings and I, so I have a, a number of jobs. I'm the CEO, I'm the legal advisor, I'm the secretary, I'm the featured writer. So I have all these jobs and I like meet with my boss, which is me. And we talk about like progress and stuff, which I know it sounds ridiculous, but it really helps me. Yeah. And you did this thing where you wrote yourself their employment letter, which I thought was so neat because anyone, even if you're not retired or whatever, or entrepreneur, you can do this for yourself. Can you talk a little bit about that? Honestly, I thought about my ideal job and I wrote it down and I gave myself that ideal job. And I, I've known I want, I've wanted to be a writer since I was a kid. I've already written one book and I'm working on my second. I'm starting to actually start five since I finished my first one. I'm just trying to pick one that I don't hate. But I just, it's the act of writing that I love and just making sure that I do it enough hours in the day to make myself happy because the joy is in the doing, but it's also the misery is in the doing. Like it's hard to get sit down and make myself write if I don't feel like it. And for me, the job, the employment letter is making sure that I do it even when I don't feel like it. Because at the end of the day, I'm much happier when I'm doing the things I feel like I ought to be doing than when I just sit on my couch and do nothing and smoke weed, you know? <laughs> yeah. So you basically wrote a letter to yourself saying, hey, you wrote it so you could tell me what you said, but you said something <laughs> like, if you don't do the job, you'll be like measured on your success at the end of the year. Like, right? Yes, exactly. So I kind of, I, I wrote it to coincide with my at the end of my lease. So basically, if I don't have my second book done and in draft form ready for an editor, then I have to go look for a job because it's been three years at that point since I published my first book. And I just need to, you know, I need to get myself a deadline because I don't have one from somebody else. So it's a self-imposed deadline. And I'm pretty sure I'm going to make it because I write every day and I just have to pick a book and not hate it and <laughs> keep editing it until I not hate it. Yeah, that's that's awesome. You could technically, right, go choose to work part time or do something else. So is there a reason why you're just like, you know what, though, but like, I love the freedom that I have, even though like I have to create all this structure, you still choose to do it this way versus finding some other thing you want to do? Right now, I love my life. Like, honestly, every day is so fun. You know, I just got back from a month and a half in Europe and I do anything I want whenever I want. And the freedom is amazing. So I do love my life. Then there are days where I, you know, feel like I don't have a place in the system and I miss being a normal person and I consider getting a job. So I've, I've definitely applied for some jobs, like jobs that just sounded fun, like not for the money, just like I, I applied to be a nude art model and I applied to do a senior counsel for a marijuana company and you know, stuff like that. So it's more about, am I living the life that I want to live and just keep re reevaluating that? Cause that's not always going to stay the same. And I don't want to just drift through life. I want to make sure that I'm li living intentionally. Right. But you have the options. Yes. Exactly. It's it. That's the big part of it. It's like, I'm working because I want to work. I'm doing this because I want to do it and not because I feel like I have to. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that you talk about on your blog, you're not you're like, you don't shy away from, which I really appreciate. It's just like the mental health part of this journey. Yeah. <laughs> Can you share about that? You know, I am no psychologist, you know, I have no degree, but I feel like from my own personal experience and then seeing others, like we all kind of have our thing and things that trigger us or moods. I know me, I feel like definitely the seasons change. So probably like some, something seasonal happens for me when it's winter and it's cold in New York city. So we might think, and yes, I'm not saying that the job is not the reason why most people are not happy with their life, 
but we'll just place it on the job of why they're happy. They're like, well, when, when I'm financially independent or like I'm not working here, then I'll be happy. Not realizing that like the inner work and mental health, it doesn't matter what you do, whether you reach financial independence, whether you have a million dollars or pay off your debt, that feeling is always probably going to be there or be magnified actually even more. So can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, of course. So I've been struggling with my mental health since I was five years old. I've been clinically depressed for as long as I can remember. And it's always been an easy thing to load off on. I was, well, it's because I'm stressed with school. It's because I'm, I have this job that I hate. It's because so-and-so just broke up with me or whatever. But then when you're retired and you have nothing else to blame it on, it can either amplify it because, like I said, if I sat on my couch and just smoked weed all the time, I would be so depressed. And I know that about myself. But retiring was one of the major things that I think I could do to treat my depression. Like now I'm living the life. Like I kind of have a mindset. If I have to be here, if I have to keep living, then I'm going to live it on my terms. I'm going to do my life my own way. And so waking up every day, knowing that I'm living my life exactly how I want to live it has helped tremendously. I'm also, of course, on medication. And, you know, I have all these, I read all these books on stoicism and like how to change your attitude and what you can control and what you can't control. And I mean, it's an, it's an ongoing battle, but I'm a million times better than I was before. And I think, you know, it's, it just the, the intentionality about it helps a lot. Mm, mm, yeah. Thanks for sharing that. And I think too, for anyone listening. So how, what made you, I know you said you were just been dealing with this since you were five, but at what point do you say, you know what, I probably need to get help. It's not just something I can deal with myself. Yeah. I think I was 20 when I first started getting help. It was like when my first boyfriend woke up with me and I was kind of a rock bottom and I started taking medication and going to therapy and I've been on and off that, you know, in my entire life, but I, I've kind of gotten to the point where I know when I'm feeling bad and when I need to go get help and when I can do it by myself and when I'm fine. So it's, it just, it's ebbs and flows and just knowing yourself and knowing the cycles and knowing that this isn't the end of the world. I feel like crap today, but it's not going to be permanent. And that's, that's just experience. That's just living life and knowing yourself. Mm -hmm. And then just like the importance of even if you have to, you know, spend money to see someone yeah. for medication, like that might be something that you may need to do. Yeah, it's money well spent, in my opinion. Yeah, because I always tell myself when I spend money, this is what money is there for to make my life easier to make my life better. And I happily spend money when I know that it'll make my life better. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And whatever that better is for you that you're listening, um, it's like, that's the hardest part is figuring out what that better is. Right. I was reading this book, so I'm finishing it now. And it's called The Geometry of Wealth. And it talks about wealth being funded contentment. So basically, is that did I say that right? I think I said it right. Essentially, like it's being able to fund your life and a good life at that. And hopefully I said that right. <laughs> but like being rich is like you're on this constant treadmill of wanting more and having wealth is really just a matter of being able to fund what you want, your like your contentment. And like, that's where most people don't know what is like their content level, like what actually makes them happy. Like, then they like kind of spend it on things that actually don't long-term improve anything, just short-term, which is fine, but not for a sustainable kind of happiness. Book sounds fascinating. I'm putting it on my to-read list. Yeah, so definitely it's a good book. Probably we'll have to invite the author on for that. But, you know, I think I'm glad you're sharing that. And you did bring up, so stoicism, you actually had a piece where I was like enjoying it because you had like five takeaways about stoicism that people can apply to their financial journey. And I did want to kind of like summarize some of that because I think it might just be helpful as a, an approach for people to stay committed or motivated on this journey. Yeah, absolutely. I read a book. It was called The Guide to the Good Life. I, I consider stoicism a religion for people who are not religious it's a, a philosophy of life on how to live, how to be tranquil, how to not let outside influences influence your mood too much and have as much control over your outlook as possible. And I love it. I, I'm obsessed with stoicism. I read as much as I can about it now. But I had five quotes that I think were really good. Not needing wealth is more valuable than wealth itself, which I really liked. Stoics value their freedom, and they are therefore reluctant to do anything that will give others power over them. But if we seek social status, we give other people power over us. We have to do things calculated to make them admire us. So it's more about knowing what's important to you as opposed to keeping up with the Joneses. And I think that's the hardest part about life is just following path of least resistance. 
a stoic who disparages wealth might become wealthier than most individuals whose principal goal is that is its acquisition because the stoic has single-mindedness and self-discipline. There's two more quotes. For most people, experiencing delight requires a change in circumstances. They might, for example, have to require a new consumer gadget. Stoics, in contrast, can experience delight without any such change because they can practice negative visualization. And negative visualization is just picturing the, having something that you don't like and then realizing that you don't have it and kind of experiencing that joy. So I do that a lot. This is going to sound really gruesome and grim, but like my mom is my favorite person in the world. So I know one day I'm going to lose her. So occasionally I tell myself, oh, my mom is dead. And I kind of go through that emotions of like how it feels to lose her. And then I go through the happy emotion of realizing that she's still here. And I have to, it kind of makes you appreciate what you have while you have it, if that makes sense. So I think I find that so valuable to do just for everything. I mean, your health, your, well, your possessions, everything's on loan to you. And eventually the universe is going to take it back. So just appreciate what you have while you have it and visualizing you not having it and how that emotion feels and getting used to it is, it will theoretically help you with life. Yeah. That is so key. And I've never consciously done it. Like said, that's like, I'm going to sit and do that, but I definitely do that. Like I think of especially having kids. Oh my gosh. As parents, the idea, like they say, like your heart now walks outside of you. So like there's things that can happen. And then the more you have, and the more people you have to worry about, like in the world, sometimes for me, I'm like realizing like, wait a second, like they're here. Like I have them, you know, like it's okay. Or when I wake up from like a nightmare or something that's like an unsettling dream and it's so upsetting. And then I wake up, I'm like, wait, that did not happen. Thank God. You know, like that's that feeling. Yeah. That's exactly it. A hundred percent. Like this is their childhood. This is the what, the point you're supposed to be enjoying the good or the bad. This is it right now. Just keep reminding yourself that this is life and you're not waiting for something to happen. And the final quote is just what we talked about earlier. Seek friends who share our values and learn from how they live their life. I think that good friends are really the point of like that you live a lot longer, you live a lot happier if you find your social circle. And that's another reason why I love that this, you know, early retirement thing is such a big, big thing now. It's so easy to find people who are into that mindset. And I have so many friends now, like when I started this journey, I had two or three that did it. And now I have dozens of people that I talk to regularly who are in, in, in the FI mindset and understand why people put experiences over things and aren't buying things just to buy things and aren't keeping up with the Joneses. And it's, it's made life so much better having people who know that and understand that. Yeah. Yeah. I always say that social media is people complain about it a lot and yeah, there's some bad things about it, but it's good because you can normally find people and connect with people that you normally like did not even know existed. And so I think that's like definitely something amazing. Like we live in a time where even if in real life, you don't have people that get it, you can connect and find groups and to support of people who like you can travel on this journey with together. It's so important. Absolutely. Like I think it would be so lonely to do it by yourself and to have everyone think that you're kind of a weirdo for doing it. And like you could have the freedom, but if you don't have the social contacts, then I, I think it wouldn't be a sustainable journey. Yeah. And I think people discount that so much. Like they're like, you know, like, yes, everyone keeps saying I need to find a circle that I can ascend with or that can connect with. But it seems so kind of minute for some people when it's like really not like I've been in situations where like even with, whether with business or whether it's in masterminds for a business or in communities like this where I'm talking to you and I'm like, wow, like this life. And when I'm outside of it, right, when like the real world kind of like catches up to me again, I'm like, then I get back to maybe a no way of thinking. And then the only way that it pulls me out that I know that, wait a second, this is not the norm. The norm that I want is on this side. It's because I run in those circles again and it helps reinvigorate me to like my goals. Yeah. Like meeting people who have done it and meeting people who are trying to do it and meeting people who realize it's possible makes you realize that it's possible and it's, it's invaluable. Yeah. So Anita, I'm going to um, share like the links to some of the blogs that we kind of mentioned, especially those five quotes. I want people to like read it. And so please let everyone know where they can find more about you, how they can find out about your first book and then maybe like what they can look out for in the future. Okay, great. Yeah, my blog is thepowerofthrift.com. The name of my book is Operation Enough. I got How to Retire Remarkably Early. It's on Amazon or wherever you buy electronic books or regular books. It's not in bookstores, unfortunately, but it's online anywhere you can find them. Yeah, and I'm my all my contact information is on, on my blog and I love getting emails and I love talking to people. So yeah, I'm all I'm out there. <laughs> right. I will share those links in the episode show notes for this episode. 
Thank you so much again, Anita, for sharing your story with us. For sure. Thank you for having me on. This is great. I really hope you liked that conversation with Anita. I love talking to her. It really felt like I was talking to an old friend, just peeling back the layers of what financial independence and what early retirement life is like, right? Like, what does that look like? Because you may envision that you want to basically not work, but how do you spend your days? How do you still feel motivated and inspired in the world, right? Because we are tied to what we do. And I do believe that work is important. And so I hope that this gave you some insight onto the journey to financial independence and early retirement and what they might look like for you. And then you actually got some actionable tips too that you can apply to your own life. Now, once again, if you want the episode show notes, this is episode 136. Go to journeytolaunch.com slash episode 136. Or if you're listening to this in a podcast player like Apple Podcasts, that's that purple app on your Apple phone or your iPhone or somewhere else, you'll be able to kind of click the link in there in the description. And then as always, if you are listening to this in Apple Podcasts, please don't forget to rate, review and subscribe. Make sure you subscribe wherever you listen to this episode because then you won't miss an episode coming out. And we release episodes every Wednesday. So you can always depend that there'll be a brand new episode coming out every Wednesday. And of course, we have such great episodes in the past. I mean, this is episode 136, which means there are 135 more episodes that can blow your mind if you go back. And so if you do want a list of all the episodes by subject, and so what we did was I knew that people would ask, well, I want more information about real estate or I want more information about people who actually retired early that I wanted you guys to be able to go and see all those episodes related to that subject. So you can do that by going to journeytolaunch.com slash podcast index, and it will take you to the podcast index page where you can search for episodes based on the topics that you enjoy. Once again, if you want to join myself, Grant, and some other awesome personal finance experts and your fellow journeyers and other people who want to reach financial freedom at the Financial Freedom Summit, come join us. It's from May 1st to May 3rd in St. Louis, and you can get your ticket by going to journeytolaunch.com slash freedom summit. I'll also link all of the links that I talked about in the episode show notes for this podcast. And then also, if you want to check out the videos that Grant and I did, go to journeytolaunch.com slash money collective. Make sure you're following me on social media to check them out. Don't forget, I'm on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Journey to Launch. Don't forget to tag me when you're listening. Take a screenshot, share it on your main feed, share it with your friends, text them the episode, share the knowledge with the people that you love. All right. So until next week, keep on journeying, journeyers. Journeyers.